All right, we are live here on Tuesday night. I am Dr. Boz, and this is the Dr. Boz Show. Getting that microphone a little closer. And uh, welcoming all the people onto the channel. I have a really great show for you tonight. I am super excited about this and have been working on it all day. Uh, thanks for uh, my few minutes of tardiness. Uh, and I will tell you that tonight we are going to talk about a very special case about a, uh, a specific uh, brain that reversed dementia. It is such a great teachable case. I, I hope you stick around for it and that you've got some great questions. So put those in the comments. We'll take those on at the end. Thanks for the affirmations of all the good sound. Again, not a guarantee on this show, but um, the improvements of uh, this show continue at every mistake I make. So thank you for that. I am uh, not just a little bit passionate about helping brains. This has been something that's been a thread through my career from the shock trauma rotations in residency to the first uh, season of my career in uh, Salt Lake City, Utah, to many years in South Dakota and now here in Florida. Uh, you have uh, uh, a guarantee by me that I will go to my grave still chasing the fascinations about how the human brain can repair after injury. And this story leaves no uh, wonder unturned that is just a fascination for me. Um, you know, I have been teaching people about brains for many years, and one of my favorite um, favorite opportunities was helping the Department of Defense and repairing brains for their soldiers and their leaders. I have an online course that I've done with that in the past and I am repeating that this December. If you're looking uh, at uh, considering that, I will have a Good Friday promo code for that, so stay tuned. Um, but first, before we get uh, away from myself, I'm going to keep looking at the comments you've got and do some of the traditions we have on the show. One of them is to check my numbers and report in for how my week has been. So I am uh, yeah, looking at numbers today with uh, a, a really, I'm trying to think what hour is it? Um, yeah, at least 48 hour fast. We're probably about uh, 51 hours into a fast. And I, I did really well. I went, I went home last night and went straight to bed. Um, I also did a, a workout, which I hadn't done in a while, and I am definitely sore <laughs> today. So I, I actually worked out once right at the onset of the fast on Sunday, and then I did a, a CrossFit workout yesterday that I'm definitely walking like I'm a 50-year-old lady for sure. <laughs> So the numbers in my my ketones 0 0.9, my glucose is 49. I will tell you that I can feel I could feel the blood sugar dropping, and um, I had a couple little setbacks right before this. But I bet that ketone, if I would just not do anything, uh, it would be at least in the ones in the next few minutes. But I do not feel like a blood sugar of 49. I feel really good, um, and I know that that workout yesterday really helped. Uh, I am. I am preparing for a, a couple of things that um, I need to prepare for. <laughs> One of them is um, this week I do a speech on Friday. I, I get to talk at the Faith Leaders, uh, Florida Faith Leaders in Orlando. I'm really excited about that. So I, uh, I have this really great case and I am truly uh, hoping that I can do it justice. Before I hop over there, I have one other announcement for uh, for folks. And if you're in, if you like a good deal, this is where you need to pay attention. Uh, let me see if I can share the right screen here. Let's see. Nope, not the right one yet. <laughs> there we go. All right, let's make this uh, a little bit smaller so you can see everything I need you to see. Oh, not that one. Um, well, I bet if I do this, it's going to be easier. And almost hang in there. I'm almost got it straight. I'll get you. Sorry. Oh, that's what I want. Okay. So this is my website, bozmd.com. And I want, uh, I have, as many of you know, I have been, had one of my products, my favorite product that you can see over my shoulder. Oh, uh, yeah. That max strength bag of uh, MCT plus BHB on sale. Um, and when that one's gone, it's gone. But 
Uh, I, in the world of being a salesman, I'm just not, I'm a much better scientist than a salesman, but it pays the bills, people. So, um, and I, I do really use these products for my patients. But there are two products that are gonna be 50% off for a short period of time. And um, I would encourage you that if you haven't bought these two products, you should. It is the BHB Cucumber Lemon and BHB, um, so this one right here, uh, if you put in promo code OCT50, I'll type that in the in the comments here too, OCT50, and then I should probably pin that bad boy to the top. Let's do that. Um, okay, so that will get you 50% off of this product and 50% off of my favorite fall product, uh, which is, um, go back to the store, uh, the Mexican Spice. Uh, it's a chocolate with a really kind of cinnamony, um, little bit of cayenne pepper uh, spice in it. And the reason is they expire at the end of November. So I have to get rid of the ones that expire. Uh, and you get, um, they don't go bad, but you have to follow the rules when you're selling these things. And I just didn't notice that they were so close to expiration dates. So as soon as the ones that um, are not... Um, going to expire at in in the end of November uh, the the sale will not include those I mean it only includes the ones that are going to expire at the end of November again you can use them they are good my family <laughs> has them much longer than that but uh, you can't sell them after that date so that's the chocolate one just let me find it here here's number three uh, on this page and where is the Mexican spice one at go to four Oh, there it is. Yeah, Max String Mexican Spice right there on the fourth page. Um, this is actually one of my favorites. I like this one hot. I used to put this in my coffee when I was um, adding flavors to my coffee. There's a great video there telling you about why I like it and what I do with it. But if you type that promo code OCT50 uh, and you are in the zone where they're 50% off, you'll see the coupon. As soon as that uh, those, uh, those are sold, uh, you'll see that sale go away. So help me not have to throw any of those away. Um, help me be a little better salesperson. <laughs> and um, uh, yeah, then we both win, right? Okay, let's get on to this case. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about what I've been doing um, and why this is, oh, I'm just, I pray I can do this case justice. Okay, um, this summer when I was on stage with, um, uh, Chris Palmer. Uh, he is an, a medical doctor, a psychiatrist from Harvard, and he is a proponent of the ketogenic diet. And he also is kind of a geek about brains. So he talks about his uh, psychiatric uh, pa patient population and how much his, um, his practice has been improved with the ketogenic diet. Uh, it has, you know, transformed patients' lives and you know, when he's on stage and I'm on stage, I think we have a very similar language. So we were talking afterwards and I was telling him about the case I'm gonna to share tonight. He asked me to write up the case in a publication that will be in Frontiers Medicine where they're doing several case studies about what a ketogenic diet can do. So he's writing up some, um, some of his cases. He asked me to do this and I said, oh, for heaven's sakes, I haven't done that since residency, so I mean, since I was, you know, early in my faculty years and helping a, another student, but on my own, uh, residency was the last time I would have written up a case study in a formal way. Now, I might not have been back to high school English with all those terms, but I'm not afraid of writing. I just said, there is no way I can write this up alone. If you'll do this with me, I'll do it. And he said, yes. So I start to write up the case. And for many of you know, I took on a really big project that did have a profound um, um, impact on our company, which was leading 200 students through a metabolic challenge. And I, the paper was gonna be due during that metabolic challenge. And I just didn't get it done. I felt very guilty because the mom was, uh, the story is so great. But I think, you know, God had my back. And I, uh, there was an email I missed in the middle of that 21-day challenge where the extension for submitting a case was 
put out till October 31st. And I, I, you know, Chris sent me a text giving me a little nudge to get the paper done and then it made it brought to my attention that the paper wasn't going to be due until October 31st. And I thought, oh, this is God's way of saying, just do it. Uh, and in the week of celebrating my mother's life, uh, it is cases like this where I, I really feel that, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's just an honor to tell this story. So let's begin. I, I'm going to use some slides to do this. And again, <laughs> take your uh, questions and put them in that chat. I have a, uh, my helpers putting those questions that are relevant to brains and dementia into, um, into the chat. Um, but... Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about what the paper talks about, and then I'm going to tell you the case. So let's go to, yeah, let's not go to the slides just yet. I'm going to read this. So this patient has Down syndrome. So I'm going to give you a hint about a few things. Um, Down syndrome, again, uh, genetically um, altered um, chromosomes that result in uh, an intellectual disability. Uh, it is a congenital birth defect, and it's pretty common. Like one in 700 births in America have this. But when you compare Alzheimer's disease for a normal set of chromosomes, a, called a euploid uh, chromosomes of the brain, to a a Down syndrome, they there is a higher burden and density of the plaques that are typically found in Alzheimer's disease, and these plaques and neurofibril tangles occur at a younger age. It's because of this that most, you know, that the, the prevalence of Alzheimer's disease and dementia in a Down syndrome patient happens younger in their life and it really consumes a large population of the Down's uh, syndrome uh, population. Let me just give you some statistics that at the age, uh, there's 55% of all of the Down syndrome uh, patients uh, have this cognitive impairment uh, known that is pathologically associated with Alzheimer's, meaning at autopsy it's confirmed it's the same pathology in their fifth, dec fifth decades, meaning in their 40s. Uh, by the time they're in their 60s, 77% of them have uh, Alzheimer's disease uh, at, at, at death. So I'm going to skip the sciencey part of this and get to, get to the uh, just you'll, if if this publication picks our our case because not all cases will get presented, uh, I'll let you read about it there and I'll share it with you when that happens. But in the event that they don't uh, pick our case, I really just wanted to share it with the people that tune in to my show and mostly honor this mother and her daughter. Uh, let's uh, let's begin. All right, so our patient is named Susie. Susie Susie is 47 years old and she has Down syndrome. We're gonna talk about her life from the age of uh, 2014, when she was 39 years old, uh, to her life at the age uh, uh, now at 47. Actually, she just turned 48 a couple of weeks ago. Um, so yes, she. I'm gonna read some of this case. So she presented at 47 years old. She was an unmarried woman with uh, the diagnosis of Down syndrome and had an, a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease that had been stamped upon her chart in 2018. Um, before the onset of Alzheimer's disease, she had the she had Down syndrome and she had some limitations. She was not able to hold a job or live independently, but she was able to function at a pretty good level around the house and around their hobby farm uh, in, uh, in Florida here. Uh, she was pretty overweight. Actually, she would be considered obese with a body mass index of 46. She weighed uh, 216 pounds and she was um, 57 inches. So six, uh, 60 inches is five feet tall. So she's just, you know, she's a few inches shy of, you know, like four and a half feet tall. Um, she participated in many of these fa family activities around the farm, uh, was she in which included going to care for the horses and the dogs. Uh, she could go to the barn, she could clean out one of the stalls, she could move the horses out of the stalls, clean the stalls, return the animals to the stalls, uh, and do that without any chaperone. She had pretty good autonomy where they could leave her alone for up to five hours at home. She would pick out her own clothes, she would shower without assistance. Um, she made some simple meals in the microwave, 
and her communication skills had some limitation that they would rarely use a three-syllable word, but she was able to get her messages across to her family. All right, so let's begin. In 2014, um, she was 216 pounds, a body mass index um, uh, of around 46. And this picture is one of the pictures mom sent in that she thinks might have been around that time. Actually, I think this was after she's lost some of the weight. Um, yeah, I think this picture was taken in 2020 where um, she, I just want you to remember the look on her face here, how, how sad she looks. Um, that this was a very common image of her daughter as the story unfolds. So Susie presented with memory loss signs at, in 2014. And the family was very much aware that this might be a problem. So they watched it. They went in and told their daughter, their doctor about it. And at the time, again, her, she was very overweight. The doctor said she really does need to lose weight. If you could put her on a paleo diet, um, we think you could lose some weight. So the mom lowered her carbohydrates uh, to a uh, hundred grams per day um, uh, and this was at that same visit where she presented with signs of memory loss she had really had some changes in her um, in her mood fear and anxiety became a much higher problem and she started becoming uh, rather obsessed with um, several um, several uh, points that weren't were not disrupted before like she really had to count uh, or not count things. She really had to look at the clothing she was wearing. She used to have this varied uh, wardrobe and she started saying no to certain colors and no to certain patterns and just became very obsessed with, she would only, uh, she only would wear one outfit by this point. Um, actually, it maybe wasn't quite in 2014, it was in the next couple years. But she could no longer be left alone. The memory problems were so bad. Uh, that if she was left alone for more than 30 minutes, there were dangerous things happening like, um, you know, an oven, uh, she would touch an oven that was hot or, or she would walk right out the door and then not know how to find her way back home. Um, so again, she went from being autonomous, like saying, you know, Susie, it's time to take a, a shower. And she actually really liked showers. Um, to needing assistance with bathing and toileting. Uh, she couldn't uh, you know, do her own toileting anymore. And she really became fearful of the shower head. That was another part of her anxiety. So her memory loss um, also led to a, a really difficult part for the family, which was, you know, there were rules. Um, they, they would use consequences and rewards to help her behavior. And she couldn't remember the rules. She couldn't remember the incentives. She couldn't remember the consequences. And the mom said, you know, we just had to stop doing that. And unfortunately, the behavior escalated when there was just no way to give her feedback on what was happening inside her mind. Um, the other thing that happened that started in 2014 and really grew over the next couple of years was she needed extended naps. So they started this paleo diet at this visit where all of this was reviewed, uh, said 100 total grams of carbohydrates per day. And as you look at what happened over the next couple of years, she did lose some weight. She's now down to 156 pounds. Uh, her body mass index is still considered obese at, at 33. Um, and we are now four years later. Um, the dementia has worsened. Uh, they took her to a memory care facility. The primary care said, okay, I think we do need a specialist involved. And um, the specialist looked for other causes of dementia. They looked for, you know, she had been on thyroid medicine. That was about the only medication she'd been on before all this started. Uh, and uh, he saw no treatable causes for the dementia. Um, they started some of the medications, uh, paroxetine, which is also known as Paxil, for some of the severe paranoias and anxiety and the obsessive compulsive uh, behavior. Also, a memantine is a memory drug. Her anxiety had become such a problem that they were using alprazolam, which is uh, like a, a short-acting sedative. And if you've taken my brains course, you'll know my opinion on alpra alprazolam. It's not my opinion. There's very good evidence to say that's not going to help her. But the family was like, I'm not sure what else to do. She's super tired. We can't give her anything really more sedating. But um, she really gets herself wound up, like, to, I mean, uh, with these 
with these anxiety obsession uh, moments. All right, move on to 2020. She now has lost some more weight. She has um, continued with that paleo diet, really kept those carbs around 100, and she's now down to 126 pounds. That's still overweight, but she's out of the obese range now. She's lost a total of 90 pounds by this point. And again, this is hard work for the family. They have to, um, her memory has really declined to the point where um, uh, she has, uh, let me just find this in my notes here. Yeah, so by the time she's lost uh, 90 pounds in 2020, um, despite these medications, uh, her symptoms have all declined. She ha actually had new symptoms where she began having moments where she'd stare off into space and then she would lose total uh, control of her bladder. Uh, they did an EEG and found out that these were um, absence seizures, so the kind of like uh, spacey seizures and they started her on something called lamictal. Uh, Lamotrigine is the other name for it. The seizures and bladder loss decreased a little bit, so they were only happening about six to 10 times per week. So I just want you to imagine this uh, child with Down syndrome in their mid-40s uh, and how much burden uh, that uh, this decline in her brain has caused. Um, they, um, the family is amazingly generous with their life and their journey, and they're doing everything they can to help their daughter. Um, you know, the family has been uh, blessed by Susie's presence uh, since her birth, and if you've ever had a close relationship with someone with Down syndrome, I say those words on purpose because um, just like this story, uh, her life is a blessing to show what, what's about to happen next. So the carbohydrates uh, in 2021 were reduced to 75 grams per day um, because uh, they said, well, you know, there's, there's some evidence that if you lower those carbohydrates further, we might be able to get a little more weight off, but it's supposed to be, you know, we think that's really helpful metabolically, uh, might do a good job for her seizures. And so mom took it from 100 grams a day to 75 total carbohydrate grams uh, or grams of carbohydrates per day. Um, throughout that time, she lost another 10 pounds, but the symptoms worsened. Um, I want to read some of this because I think the details are really important here. Um, so yeah, her paranoia, isolation, and forgetfulness um, were, were, were worse. Uh, for example, um, and she advanced to the point where she needed adult daycare uh, when her inability to navigate around obstacles was compromised. For example, in an attempt uh, to hand her mother an item uh, if she, when the mother was positioned on the other side of a table. If she would walk up to the table, she could not navigate her body around the table to get to her mother. And she would start to have anxiety and a fit, like, why can't I get to you? She couldn't process that the table in front of her was the obstacle and she needed to walk around it. And if you've ever struggled with anybody who is losing their memory, um, and they really think they can drive. <laughs> like this is not the husband wife thing where I drive more safely than you and the thing my husband might chirp about. Um, no, this is, they, they truly believe, they cannot understand how they can't do something they used to do. And the same frustration was happening in Susie's life. There was another um, advancement in her care where they had to have around the clock care when her reasoning skills were slipping to the point where she would, uh, if, if the garbage had, um, had food in it, she would rummage through the garbage and eat um, decompensating food, uh, you know, food that had spoiled that was in the trash or raw meat, she would just start eating it. So they had several things they had to do to keep her safe. Um, in, in December of 2021, uh, this scale of um, activities of daily living scale, which is specifically looking at um, 23 uh, items in uh, ranking a dementia patient. And it really shows, uh, especially caregivers, how um, uh, can, can answer this when patients are demented and you ask them a question, it doesn't often uh, give you the right answer. You really need to interview the people around them. So as they looked at Susie's life, uh, they, they answered these 23 questions and she scored a 35 out of a possible 78 where the lower the score, the more the severe the impairment. Uh, a, a number of 35 is a very severely impaired memory patient. 
Um, and let me just list some of the resources that it was now taking to take care of uh, Susie. Despite losing over 100 pounds at this point on a low carb diet, um, in December of 2021, um, she, um, here's what she needed. She needed adult daycare. Um, I'm gonna go back to this image right here. Adult daycare, she needed a um, complete bathing, complete toileting assistant, um, adult incontinent garments all the time. They had to lock up the cupboards, lock up the refrigerators, put door alarms on preventing her from unnoticed uh, entries or exits. Um, there was a nanny cam at night because she would wake up in the night and she would start to wander. Um, so they needed to monitor her sleep better. Uh, the, the care team in her in her medical world had advanced to a full memory care team, including a social worker, a geriatrician, uh, caregiver support for the team. And like I said, this alprazolam had been now added to the list of, this is the only way they could see to, to really take care of um, her. And that's where something, um, something I, I started doing when I was in South Dakota was leading a support group. Mm -hmm. And the support group would ha meet on Fridays when I was in South Dakota. And when I moved to Tampa, I promised that I would uh, restart it as soon as I found my footing. So January of, la of this year, not even 10 months ago now, um, we began a weekly support group. And this woman named Mary showed up and she said, I've been doing low carb for a while. I've been following the ketogenic diet. I've really been using what you've taught me. And she had some questions. So she would drive an hour and a half to be here for an eight, maybe it's two hours. She's from a long ways away uh, to be here for an eight o'clock meeting uh, at the bowling alley outside in the parking lot here. I mean, yeah, in North Armenia. And after two weeks of coming, she asked me if I thought her daughter, who has Down syndrome, would, would be a good candidate for, um, for the ketogenic diet. And I said yes. I said absolutely. Um, I had other experience with uh, Down syndrome doing really well. I said the key thing here is, just like with anybody when we're repairing a brain, you can't dabble in whether or not you're getting a benefit. You can lower carbs. But if you're not getting into a state of ketosis, it, you're not gonna get the repair that's out there that people talk about. So let me just tell you what happens next. Oh, that's not the one I wanted. Sorry, hold on, right here. Uh, okay, so January 2022, her mother comes to this group. And mom goes home on the second week and says, all right, we are going to advance your further, they're gonna advance the, the diet further uh, to 20 total grams per day and mom was gonna test for ketones. So within a day or two, she starts making ketones. Uh, as Mary describes them, they're both hyper ketone responders, her and her daughter. Her husband, on the other hand, is not nearly as lucky as them to make as many ketones as, um, as um, Susie and, and her mother are. I tell, because they, they eat sardines. <laughs> I don't think they've been introduced to sardines at this part of the story, but um, within seven days of producing ketones, uh, Susie starts waking up unprompted in the morning. She gets out of bed. She's got energy for like the first time. And again, this has been going on since 2014. It's eight years of caring for a severely demented Down syndrome adult who has advanced anxiety. But suddenly she didn't, want to lay down and take a nap in the afternoon. Her fatigue was not not present. Could she say that yet? Uh, by the 10th day, um, she said um, she really just had the best energy. Her, she would go to sleep. That nanny cam that was monitoring her sleep at night would no longer show movements or getting out of bed or restlessness. She really slept well. She had higher quality sleep. And again, this was measured uh, by some of those metrics that come on one of the on the nanny cams. 14 days into the ketogenic uh, into ketosis. Now, mind you, she's already lost a hundred pounds with a low carb diet. But we are 14 days into producing a ketogenic diet. And she said, the seizures stopped. Like, I have been changing her undergarments every day, or at least most days a week, you know, up to 10 times a week these seizures would happen. And despite the medications at the level that we were, the doctor was doing, you know, using it, 
Um, they happened all the time. And she was now fully continent again. Uh, all of the undergarment pads were dry. And you know, sometimes mom might not see when the seizure happens, but she would empty her bladder every time the seizure happened. So she's like, not only is there like an improvement in her, in her energy, but these seizures are gone. I mean, could it do that? So mom's coming back now two weeks in saying, is this possible? Almost afraid to speak it out loud. Within 28 days of producing ketones, she no longer required the adult daycare or the hyper supervision and that the adult daycare or a family member being with her 24 hours a day, seven days a week, don't look away, uh, was she didn't need that anymore. And the paranoia was like ameliorated. There was, I mean, there's a natural part of Susie that wasn't paranoid, that wasn't obsessed with things. And they had all attributed this, that it must be the disease happening in her brain causing this. As, um, uh, as that melted away, she returned to having those unsupervised showers that again, Susie used to love showers. Like, you know, okay, Susie, you already showered today. You don't, know to, you don't need to do that again. To the point where she was paranoid of the water coming out of the shower head. And now she was suddenly going back to the shower saying, I wanna take a shower. And, um, and that, that wardrobe, which really, if it's really funny to hear the mom talk about this, she's like, it was one outfit. If that outfit wasn't clean and I didn't have the backup outfit clean, she didn't want to wear anything. She was totally obsessed that it had to be this outfit. And then suddenly she didn't have that restriction. She was like, oh, I want to wear something with a color or whatever it is. And again, this is all like eight months ago. Uh, so the wardrobe expanded back up to the other clothes. The other part was, as the family would partake in church activities or other social activities, um, Susie was back to participating. Instead of just tolerating it and really not liking that social environment or the family having to find you know, a quick introduction, like not wanting to give up that their daughter needs socialization, that's part of being a healthy human. Um, but the, that anxiety and paranoia had just robbed her of that opportunity for, for now eight years. But she suddenly was interested in her social events and her, her sweetheart became something where she was talking to him again and really improving uh, her social functions. Because by Valentine's Day, so now we're at six weeks, uh, she had two things. This just gives me the biggest love. So this is the picture on Valentine's Day where she, she, wants, she told mom, I want a picture on Valentine's Day with my sweetheart. And her mother's like, what? Okay, uh, we can do that. Like even just to, to be attracted to this was shocking to the mom. She's like, for eight years, there was this zone in the day that was do not touch Susie. Do not bother her. Do not touch her. Just leave her alone. Leave her alone for this hour and a half. And it's like from like 3.30 or 4 o'clock till about 6 o'clock. And if you can just don't touch her, don't upset her, she'll calm down. She takes a little nap. She rests. And then she'll be fine for the evening. And this was ingrained in their life. Do not disturb this. Well, the one time that the photographer could come over and take this picture of uh, Susie and her sweetheart was during the don't touch zone. The time when Susie would get super irritable and you shouldn't interface with her. You sure as heck shouldn't ask her to smile for a photograph. And I don't know if you can see that, but that is, <laughs> that is the most adorable smile on a Down syndrome patient, especially if you like rewind this video and see what was her look like for years, mom said she would look down, she would have an expression on her face of this sadness, of this distance, that there was a sign that she just wasn't in there anymore. It, she wasn't emotion, she wasn't alive in there in a way that she used to be. And the family had all but given up hope, and so had the medical team, until mom said, do you think I can do ketosis in my daughter? Uh, her focus improved, her memory improved, and her mood improved. Um, she was now six weeks into the ketogenic diet, and she was about to return to her doctor to look at, how, do I, does she really need all these medications? Um, as you look at six months into this, 
Her weight got down to 104. Um, the doctor stopped the anxiety medications of Paxil. She stopped the memory medications of the Memantine, and the Alprazolam no longer was needed two to three times a week, but maybe one time over a two to three month period. Uh, and most importantly, the doctor said, well, let's take that quiz again to see how well she's managing. And when she looked at her ADL score, it was back up to a 58. And although for you and I, that would not be a normal, this was the baseline that Susie was at. And let, let me just not, uh, not miss that there was a, a remarkable moment that was a few weeks into, the ke into ketosis where Susie says to her mother, her mom's asking her something, and uh, um, her mother, Mary, says to Susie, are, are you sure, do you get it? And Susie replied, I understand. And this was a moment that just took the breath out of Mary because in all of her years, Susie had not used a three-syllable word like understand. It gives me goosebumps to tell this because for a cognitive performance to have an advancement in articulation, it is, it is not just the reversal of dementia. It is tapping into a part of the brain that Susie's probably been denied to be able to use for her whole life. Because the only way you can do that is when the inflammation in the brain is gone. When you're taking care of a brain injury and you want that the optimal outcome for a, for a brain uh, health, Anything you can do to reverse the, the inflammation at a cellular level is how you get the best outcomes. And I contend you don't get a better job of that outside of the ketogenic diet. So let me, let me just do this one, one, two last slides here where her eating, her walking, her bathing, and the bathroom all were now happening without the help of her family that she could now go take the dogs for a walk for an hour and come back with the dogs. Again, she couldn't even go out into the yard and really feel a sense of calmness to get back in the, in the house without being anxious a year ago this week. She's kept the weight off for all that time. And I like to point out this timeline. So in case you lost track of what I was talking about, she started out at 261 or 216 pounds. That's a body mass index of 46. That's extremely obese. And she was 39. She just turned 48. And she's at 104 pounds with, and at her height, that's a body mass index of 22.5. Perfectly normal. She has a restored baseline for the autonomy that Susie's had in her life. Her dementia has been removed from her medical chart. She is off all of the medications for dementia, seizures, and anxiety. And she has restored her deep sleep at night, her energy during the day, and her family just actually took a trip in an RV and visited family members around the country uh, or up the East Coast. And in that, my, I got to talk to the mom because I was like, <laughs> calling her about some of the questions on the history. And she's like, yeah, it's impressive. They haven't seen Susie in years. And they just can't believe how great she's doing. And so if you ever need uh, testimony for how well this diet has worked for repairing a brain, please use Susie's story. So I don't know that I get to have this story published in the, in the publication with um, Dr. Palmer, but I, I pray that it is impacting the people listening to this, that I'm not, uh, um, I, I, it's on my bucket list to have something published in a, in a publication before I die. Uh, if this is the story that I get to use, then, you know, God is uh, good. Uh, I, two weeks or two years ago this week, um, my mother is in a hospital, in a COVID locked hospital where her daughter, who wants to be right there helping the doctors not miss a thing, is about to get intubated. Three days later, she dies. And if there's one thing that I know will honor my mom, as I continue to try to do this world without her, it's to find the stories that God's put in my life and to serve them in a way that I never got to be Susie's doctor. I, her mother comes to a support group that is free. 
that I say, I'm doing my part in a community of teaching something that changed my mom's life, that my mom died healthy, that my kids remember their grandmother as Mary Poppins, the same version of that woman that raised me. And in honor of Grandma Rose, I thought this story was perfect in celebration of her two years of being in heaven. And um, I hope that it has inspired people listening. If you want to, uh, if you have any questions, we're going to take on your questions right now, and I am not going to cry. <laughs> um, I do have at the end of this uh, uh, um, end of this show. If you have, if you want to learn more about ketones and brains, I'm going to have a, a video that's a, an oldie but a goodie at the end. So stick around and click that end screen. I don't know if you guys know this, but we get good points <laughs> when you do that. Um, so let's take on some of the questions. We have one here from Stephanie, uh, and um, it let's see right there we go. Let's take this down just a little bit. There we go. Um, all right, so Stephanie writes in and says, will the use of MCT oil and cooking with coconut oil help prevent de dementia and possibly reduce it? Well, the key thing about uh, coconut oil is that there is C10 in it. Let me see if I have this, yeah. So this is one of the products that I recommend, which is C8 and C10. And uh, that is the two types of fat that are in there. You'll see a lot of people say, oh, but C8 is the best oil out there for making ketones. And indeed, you do make great ketones with C8, and you make good ketones with C10. But the difference is that C10 still has very good evidence that it crosses the blood-brain barrier and seems to be one of the key links to uh, dementia improvements and uh, dementia reversals, like in this case. Um, so coconut oil has C8 and C10 in it. However, it's only about 30% of the, <laughs> of the coconut that has those oils in it, of the coconut oil. The rest of it is C12, which is kind of like, I, I don't want to say butter, but it's, a, it's like a saturated fat from an animal. It, it, you're going to have to digest it. It's going to have to go through your lymph system. It's going to have to be processed like a fat. C8 and C10 actually are absorbed, not digested, so they go right into that portal vein, they go right into the liver, and can be converted into ketones. Not all the fats that you absorb in the portal vein get converted into ketones, it depends on your chemistry. Uh, and so the C10 that are circulating can cross the blood-brain barrier and can be a fuel in the brain. So um, I'm trying to think of the woman who's a, a pediatric ICU pediatric neurologist, um, or a neonatologist, I think, and her, oh God, I almost had her name on my tip of my tongue. Anyway, she wrote the book on um, how her husband had Alzheimer's and really had an awakening. Somebody type in the name of this woman. Oh, I've met her. I've sat next to her. I've asked her questions. I can't think of her name. Anyway, so she has been a really big founder in the research on which, uh, which fats are preventing Alzheimer's, which ones do seem to have a really profound impact on uh, brain function. And as much as C8 has the advertising for being a very good ketogenic, meaning it produces high ketones, C10 still has, the, the science is still yet to be determined. Think, they think there's a very clear uh, connection between that the presence of C8 and C10 in memory problems. So even though you get a lot of ketones with just C8, I still say both fats are worth taking. So Mary Newport, thank you very much, Cynthia, for saying that. Can't believe I couldn't think of her name. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yes, great. If you haven't read the book by Mary Newport, wonderful story and just awesome, um, just teacher and uh, servant of here's what happened to my husband who was super smart, analytical accountant and got young, Alzheimer's. So yeah, if you haven't read that book, that's great. So thank you for helping me with that. All right, oops, not go back to this. I want to go to this one. All right, so yes, um, well, you know, reducing reducing uh, the, the question you have here that I maybe didn't say, how do you reduce it? I'll tell you, you got to get the blood sugars down. That Dr. Boz ratio of having low blood sugar and high blood ketones, very, very, very important. 
Um, all right, Unicycles writes in and says, need a doc uh, recommending a diet for my mom and memory care. Personality is good, zero short-term memory. Yeah, one of the, one of the things that, there are two Harvard uh, specialists that are helping me write this paper, and one of the things they recommended that we put in this paper is to say that shouldn't Susie have had, should have, shouldn't Susie have been offered a prescription for a ketogenic diet? And you say, well, why do you need a prescription? Uh, because if anything would happen to Mary or the people taking care of uh, Susie, and she would need to go into a facility, if she needs to go into a hospital for pneumonia, and you look at the profound improvement that she has had on a ketogenic diet, but because it's not prescribed, it cannot, it, it's there because of the love of this mother, of her daughter. I mean, the mother has said several times that, yes, I know that uh, my daughter is better, but the sad part is, so am I. <laughs> she goes, I know that she's the one that's been studied, but I think I was getting like mild cognitive impairment or whatever you call it right before dementia. And she jokes about it a little, but she's serious. Like I just, it was so emotionally heavy to watch, you know, what was the, the, the personality death of my daughter. And then we were, we were ready to give up. We, we were ready to say, we've done everything that people have asked for. And yet this mother kept looking. And as she watched a few of the YouTube videos and found a different um, approach to saying, well, maybe this diet will help even further. And she didn't want to be that restrictive to her daughter. She thought, you know, gosh, she's so obsessed with food. And if you've ever cared for somebody with Down syndrome, my first patient that ever turned orange was a Down syndrome patient. And I was like, I don't know, 15 days out of residency in my first clinic job. And the, the mom brings in their Down syndrome patient and they're orange. And she says, what do you think it could be? And I'm like, I got nothing. I don't, I don't know what turns people orange. Can you give me a week? I can look it up. And sure enough, on the list was carrots. And she's like, oh, snap. Well, my, my, kid, my son, it was a boy, uh, will get up in the night and walk down to the grocery store. I caught him eating carrots out of the produce section. He's just obsessed with carrots. And so you look at the, you know, the need for a prescription um, and, you know, it sounds like, oh, those doctors, they want that. But what happens is then it's regulated, then it, or at least can be, it can happen in the absence of when mom can't be there or when a, a facility takes over. And you can clearly see by the outcomes that mom's not going to want her to uh, have anything except that. All right. Trisha writes in and said, um, oh, yeah, that's, so the personality is good, but she's in a memory care. You know, this is, this is one of those um, times where, I mean, if you look at the naysayers of a ketogenic diet, they'll all tell you, it's not sustainable. You, you, you can't be on a ketogenic diet forever. And I will tell you, there is nothing that would stop Mary from making sure her daughter is on a ketogenic diet. That the, resource, the, the benefits for that family of having their daughter back and not having the constant worry that what happens if she, if we're not looking and she walks out and, you know, or she touches an electrical outlet in a way that's gonna hurt this, you know, her, uh, there's, there's no way that you can be that careful. But um, not everybody has those resources. And so one of the first things I like to do is to, in a memory care is, yes, a ketogenic diet would be great, but how do you do that? How do you get them to do a four to one, you know, like what would be a seizure diet? Um, it's hard. But the first step you can do is ketones. And I've had several stories of people saying, I just, we, we made the doctor put a prescription that they got ketone uh, drinks three times a, a day. And you know that, that production of ketones would be even better if they would stay in, um, if they would you know, be able to take the you know, 20 total carbs per day and stay under that. Um, it's just like, well, why wouldn't you prescribe C8C10? Uh, the answer is that, I, I don't know if you heard me say that, when you, when you consume the, the fat chains of C8 and C10, some of them will turn into ketones when they go through the liver, but if your chemistry is really insulin resistant, some of them don't, and they, they circulate as fat, which is fine, but you're trying to get, the, you have to have the presence of ketones to shift that, that ketogenic state, to see the improvement in this mental health, uh, you'll hear Chris uh, Palmer, Dr. Palmer talk about this, um, that, that it is a ketogenic state. Like it was really important that first day that um, 
uh, that Mary asked, can I, can I do this for my daughter? I'm like, be sure that she's in ketosis. If you want the benefit, she has to be in ketosis. So when you swallow ketones, you got about two to maybe three hours before you're gonna pee them out. And the more you circulate ketones, the more your liver will make ketones, but you can't just sip on it for you know one drink a day. They have to have it two or three times throughout the day if they're not doing anything else to make ketones. Now that is not ideal, but I will tell you, uh, that having a mother in memory care, there's nothing about that story that's ideal. So start with the first possible thing, which is circulating ketones. Then see if you can um, get her and you're gonna have to have a social worker or somebody helping you on your side. So maybe they'll watch this, maybe they'll read one of the books and be inspired. Um, will this help uh, all types of dementia, like vascular dementia? So yeah, we had, a, had uh, our support group today and uh, one of the guys in the support group was talking about his chronic migraines. And I did some teaching about, well, a migraine that's waking you up at night that causes you to have that throbbing, very intense pain, and to the point where this gentleman would get nauseated. I'm like, that, that migraine is destroying blood cells. Okay, I mean, brain cells, excuse me. It's destroying brain cells. That when you get that vascular type of headache to the point where the brain is de being, the tissue is being destroyed. Um, there's no better ticket to dementia than chronic migraines. Uh, oh, there is other tickets to dementia, but the, what is the long-term consequences of somebody with migraines year after year after year? You must stop the migraines. And the same reason is for the, what the question about vascular dementia is. Vascular dementia, again, limits the blood flow of uh, delivering enough oxygen to keep those brain cells alive. And in a micro setting, that's what a migraine is, is that the blood supply changes when, that, when the muscle inside that artery starts to quiver, and instead of a nice steady stro s flow of blood, uh, the, the muscle around that artery starts to cramp, and it'll fasciculate, and it will stop the flow of blood. So it's like a vascular dementia. And I told this patient or this person at the support group that if there's one thing that you should be doing, it's to be getting into a high level of ketosis, that you want those migraines to stop. And the migraine stories that come through my clinic, when they dabble in ketones, when they play a little bit with ketosis, they get a tiny improvement of their migraines, but they still happen. They are still killing brain cells, every migraine. To stop the migraines, you must do what what Susie did, which was remove inflammation at a cellular level from the brain and do it long enough to repair this problem. So if you've been practicing a migraine for the better part of 30 years, you're not gonna be in ketosis for two weeks and say, oh, I'm better. No, you're gonna have to do this for a couple of years. You're gonna have to do things like get in a support group, travel that hour and a half. No, don't, don't come to Tampa. Start your own support group. You do not need an expert to lead a support group. You need to check in with people and not fall off the wagon. That's how you reverse that. Can I guarantee that vascular dementia could be reversed? It really depends on how much damage has been done to the brain, but I know the way you stop it from progressing is get the inflammation out of the brain. We'll do one more question and then I'll uh, check my numbers while I answer the next one. Um, here we go. Uh, okay, Florence says, how long does the body have to stay in ketosis before healing of the liver starts, a fatty liver? Um, oh, this one I'm gonna, the, the ferritin one I'm gonna save for next week because I totally wanna, <laughs> I wanna answer that one. Um, so the, the question about a fatty liver, the fatty liver means Remember that blood sugar that I had at 49? Um, I have a really great video out there about fatty livers showing that when to make a fatty liver, you gotta first fill it up with sugar. That sugar is called glycogen. Once the glycogen storage is full, your liver will actually make more cells to put glycogen in, but in the meantime, it's gonna store fat in the liver. It's gonna take those strings of sugar and weave them into fat. And once you put the storage of sugar into a glycogen molecule, the, the benefit is you can undo it and put it back into sugar pretty quickly. But once, when you, when you say, gosh, there's everything in the liver is stored with glycogen, uh, the next layer of storage is a fat, it's a triglyceride. And when those triglycerides end up in the, uh, in the liver with, uh, with strings of fat everywhere, we call it a fatty liver, 
But in order to empty the fat, you first have to get the glycogen empty, and then you have to start burning the fat. Uh, so if you haven't studied the keto continuum, there's go you're going to have to get into keto continuum number five and six, and you're going to have to stress that liver with times where you get that blood, blood sugar down to 60. Um, that means that you've emptied the glycogen. I know that my blood sugar of 49 at the beginning of the show means I could feel it. I knew I was in a good state because I, I did a really good job on my fast. I'm definitely thinking about my sister on Friday that we're going to, after my speech, we're going to have a glass of wine and I'm going to hang out by a pool and we're going to give a big cheers to my mother <laughs> in the sun and my poor husband's going to have to take care of both of us. <laughs> we're just going to have a good time. Uh, before she flies back home on Saturday. Um, because uh, when, I, when my blood sugar is that good, I know that I've emptied out the stored glycogen. But I didn't just do that once. I've done that week after week after week for three, four, five, however many years I've been doing this. All right, I'm checking my numbers again here because I want to see what they are at the end of the hour. Again, this is a live check. <laughs> and when I check my numbers, it's because I'm trying to show you that if you're doing... Um, a ketogenic diet, uh, you need to measure your blood numbers. So, yep, my blood sugar is 50 now, and my ketones are counting down here. So my blood sugar hasn't changed. My ketones are 1.1. So yes, an hour later, it should have gone up. Uh, I bet if I would wait another couple hours that I've been known to produce three or four ketones. But that's what it is today. I'm sure my, my muscles... <laughs> which hurt really badly after that CrossFit workout, are demanding all of the fuel. <laughs> and I'm not giving them any sugar, so they're eating up the ketones as quickly as I make them. Um, yeah. All right, so I hope that was helpful for you. God bless Susie. Uh, God bless her mother. And for those of you that pray, I would pray that you uh, wrap your arms around my sister and I as we, and my brother, my sister and brother and I, as we 